Hey Titans, this is Mordecai from GamerTitan.com. In this video, I'm going to show you how you can toggle the visibility of a UI element in your game. So one thing I'm going to start doing is start putting all of my tutorials on community content. That way, as opposed to you having to manually type out everything that I write in the video, you can go ahead and download it from community content and follow along throughout the video. So to go ahead and download it, just type in Gamer Titan Toggle UI Tutorial. Go ahead and import this into your project and you'll have access to the panel and the fully completed script that I go through in this video. Now, this is kind of a condensed version of the UI that I had in the last video. If you haven't done so and you would like to watch how this was all set up, I have a link in the description down below so you can watch all of the introduction content in terms of how to use the UI within the core. So now that we have this UI, if we were to just play the game, currently it would just show up on in front of the player at all times. And so obviously this isn't what we want. We want to be able to allow the player to either press a key bind and be able to toggle this, or perhaps click a trigger and then have it pop up. So the first thing we need to do is the thing that we will actually be modifying the visibility of is what's called the parent panel. So the first thing we need to do is go ahead and set the visibility to force off. And we're going to go ahead and make a new script here and we'll call this UI underscore example. And we're just going to simply drag this script underneath the client context. And there's a few things we want to do. First, we're going to need to reference this parent panel. We're going to just simply take the parent panel, we're going to click it, we're going to drag it as a object reference. And now we have this, we can go ahead and open up our new script. And we can paste this in here. So we have this object, which is in fact, the parent panel. So we could tell it's an object reference because we have this wait for object at the end of it. Core automatically adds that. The other thing we'll need to know is what player is actually clicking the key bind. And so because it is a client context, what we can do is we can actually access the local player. And so what I usually do is up at the top of the script, I'll do local player equals and then game dot local get local player if I could type here. And so just to let you know, I'll make this a bit larger as well. So this game dot get local player, this is only accessible from a client context script. If you try to do this in a normal context script, this wouldn't work. It would throw an error and say it would yell at you saying that you're trying to access this in a server. If you are interested in learning the various contexts in core, I will also link that video in the description down below, or you can click the card in the top right corner of your screen right now. So now that we have this parent panel and we have it referenced, we also have our local player. The thing that we're going to want to do is we want to do a press key press event, right? So pressed a binding pressed event. So using the script helper, I just clicked or I searched for pressed. So we have this binding pressed event. And so what we can do is at the very beginning, we accessed the local player. And so instead of having to pass a player by getting it from like an on player joined event, we can just copy that and we can paste it here. And so basically what's happening is, is when the script, when this UI example script loads in, it's actually connecting this binding pressed event inside of this script. And so what we can do is make a function called on binding pressed and because we copied it from the script helper we can see that it passes the player and the string and so what we'll do is we'll do function on binding pressed and it passes player and then it passes string which is in fact what the binding press that they actually sent or clicked on so we can do key press and so one thing to note is because we are only connecting this binding pressed event to the local player we can kind of ignore this player that's passed because it will in fact always be the local player. But if for whatever reason you wanted to, we could just go ahead and do player equals local player. 
And it basically would check the same thing. It would just verify that whoever pressed this binding press actually was the local player. And then the key press is, in, is a string. So we would do if key press equals, and then the string that it needs to match up to is the actual binding press that we want uh, the key bind to be. So on the core API on the website, there's this, the, under the core API right here, there's key bindings. And it has a list of all the various key bindings. So we could see on a US keyboard what button it is. And then what the string name is, is this ability extra as an example. So say that we wanted the user or the player to press T and that's how they would toggle the actual visibility of the UI. What we do is we'd use ability underscore extra underscore 24. And so once again, I'll go ahead and link this also in the description down below. That way you guys could access this more quickly. But basically that is what this key, what this binding pressed event passes through as the key press in this case. And so all we got to do is we, we put that as the string. And just to put a comment here. So basically if the player presses T, so regardless of what button they press on binding pressed event, it will fire. And then if they press T, then this is what will happen. And so what we could do is now that we know that they press T, we could do visibility. Okay. So now if we go ahead and play the game and we press T, now the UI will actually appear, but now we don't have a way for it to disappear. And also the other thing is, is we currently are not doing anything in the UI namespace, which means that we haven't enabled the cursor or done anything like that. And so as an example, say that you wanted to allow the player to actually use their mouse. This currently isn't doing that. It's just popping up the UI panel and we can't even get rid of it. But the key bind is in fact working. So what we can do is we can actually make a new function, which is what I usually do. And so what we can do is instead of simply just changing the visibility once, what we could do is if bool, then change it to force on else we can copy this and force it off. So basically what we did now is we can actually pass this and it will do the same thing as true. However, if we passed it as false, then it would turn it off. So what we'll need to do is go ahead and add a variable. And so the first time they press it, we're gonna put this in the key press and we could put and not menu active, right? But then we can make an else if, and pass the same thing, but making sure that it's true. So basically what we're doing is if you, if you, if the player presses T once and the menu is not active, it'll go ahead and make it active. If they press it again, then it would make it false. And so what we need to do here is also make the menu active is gonna be the same as the, as the Boolean, right? Because if we didn't ever change this variable, then this would never actually work. So we'll go ahead and test it one more time. So now we can press T. If we press it once, it, it turns the panel on. If we press it again, it disables it. So we can just sit here and toggle it, as you can see, and it works. So the thing is, is I mentioned that we can also get the cursor. So there's a thing called the UI namespace and under the UI namespace is cursor. So we could basically check if the cursor is visible. We can set if it is locked to the viewport, which I recommend if it is actually visible and if it can actually interact with the UI. So we're gonna go ahead and use all of these. Okay, so now we have this basic script set up and now we're actually modifying the UI namespace. And so if we toggle the UI and it's true, then it's actually gonna make the cursor visible. It's also gonna make it so it can interact with the UI, as you can see here, and it's gonna lock it to the viewport, which means that the 
the cursor can't go outside of the screen. So like if your game is in windowed mode and a player is trying to, you know, click something in the top of your of their UI and it's close to the outside of the window, if you don't lock it, their their actual cursor can go outside of the core window and then they're starting to click on other stuff if they have a different screen or something. So I recommend always using that one. And so now the difference is, is when we actually toggle, we'll see that there's this mouse cursor here. And then when I get rid of it, it goes back to being able to change uh, my character's view. But when I open this up, if you notice, I can run around because my WASD keys are still active, but now I have this cursor, so it's not taking over my player. So if the player right clicks, they can in fact still modify their camera. But for the most part, this is how you get just the basics of a UI. And so once again, I'm pressing T to open it. It opens the cursor. And then as you can see, I can't go outside this window with my cursor. But when I close it, then I'm back to normal. So this was a quicker video. Please leave in the comments down below if you think this format of you know quicker videos is more helpful than the longer duration videos I usually do. If you have any questions, please leave so in the comments down below. If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up. If you want more correlated content, please hit that subscribe button and I will catch you next time, Titans.